Greetings. We're going to cover James chapter 5 verses 12 through 20. This is the final section uh, that I'm doing on uh, the letter of James. In this section, James encourages prayer, which he mentions both in noun and verb form seven times. But he encourages prayer during times of suffering, for healing, and for restoration of fellowship. In James chapter 5 verse 12, he starts off where he says, But above all, my brethren, do not swear. Uh, that is, don't take an oath, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. But your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Now, James is not prohibiting taking oaths at all. Um, Exodus chapter 22, verse 11, and Romans chapter 1, verse 9 are both examples of where oaths are permitted and used in a proper way. Uh, what James seems to be setting forth here is perhaps the casual invoking of God's name. And I think of Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, which says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Um, and I think it means to use it in an indiscriminate way uh, to where you take the name of God and you attach it to something that is vain or worthless. And I think it has that idea. Moving on into verse 13. James says, is any among you suffering? And here he uses the Greek word kakapatheo, which means to suffer trouble, misfortune, or afflictions. And it's the idea of external suffering. Uh, now he's going to talk about internal suffering here in a moment, but he says, is any among you suffering? Then he must pray. And the word pray here is the Greek word prosukomai, and it means simply to ask God to petition him, uh, although sometimes it is used of seeking God, it has the basic idea of to petition God, to ask him for something. And then James says, is anyone cheerful? Then he is to sing praises. And you can see the contrast here between people who suffer uh, will, will come to God in prayer, and those who come to God, those who are cheerful will come to God uh, singing praises. And then he says, is any among you sick? And here he uses the generic word for sickness, osthenao, uh, which has both the idea of weakness uh, and or sickness. He says, is any among you sick? And this would be the idea of an inner suffering. He says, then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him. Now, the impression I get is that he's sick and he's at home. And what he does is he calls for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him. So this is a picture of the elders coming to the home of this sick person. And then it says that the elders are to anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the word that's translated anointing here is the Greek word alepho. Um, and it has the idea of anointing. It does have a symbolic sense, but it's also used in the sense of like rubbing somebody. Uh, so it could have a medicinal sense to it. Now, I think it's the symbolic sense, but we'll look at both. Uh, but he says they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Uh, so again, oil was used medicinally, and we'll look at Luke 10, and it was also used to symbolize the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, in Luke 10, we have the story of the Samaritan here. It says, But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, uh, that is, the man who was beaten and robbed. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And so we see here oil and wine being used in a medicinal sense uh, for the wounds that the man had. And it says, And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. We also see where oil is used as a picture of the Holy Spirit. And here Jesus is in a synagogue, and it says, And the book of, Pro of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and so on. But you see the picture here where oil becomes a symbol of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of an individual. And I think it's in the latter sense that James is using it when he talks about uh, using prayer. And notice verse 15. He says, And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. Notice it's not the prayer and the oil. Uh, and even though he uses prayer and oil in the preceding verse, here he mentions prayer alone. 
uh, prayer that is offered in faith, which restores the one who is sick. And the word restore translates the Greek verb sozo, which means to save, to recover, to restore. It's the common word to save in the Bible. By the way, if you ever do a word study on salvation, both from the Hebrew and the Greek, you'll find that the majority of uses of the word has to do with physical salvation, although there are clearly verses that have a spiritual connotation to it. Um, the physical uh, predominates in Scripture, or I should say dominates uh, in its uh, understanding in the Scripture. Just like when Peter was on the water and he uh, cried out to the Lord when he was sinking in the water and he said, Lord, save me. That's the Greek verb sozo there. And he's asking for physical salvation. Uh, he's not asking for eternal life. He's sinking and he foresees himself as dying, so he cries out to the Lord and says, Save me. And that's the picture here, that the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And it says, And the Lord will raise him up. And I think the picture here is restore him to health. And if he has committed sins, and I think here when it talks about if he has committed sins, I think it's related to divine discipline. It says they will be forgiven him. So I, I think the picture here is that the man who is sick is so because of sin that he has in his life that is unconfessed. And then he says in verse 16, Therefore confess your sins to one another. Now here, I think when he says confess your sins to one another, I think he's talking about within the context of those who came to offer prayer, that is to the elders who are praying. I don't think that this is a verse that that communicates the idea of public confession during a church service. I think he's talking about within the context here of the elders who come to pray for him. So I think it's I think it's a, a, a smaller uh, group here. I don't think that this verse again uh, advocates for uh, public confession during a church service. So he says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And then he says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, throughout the scripture, the term righteous man, or those who are regarded as righteous, is often used in a forensic sense, that is, in a legal sense, in which a person is declared righteous uh, by means of faith in Christ. So it's his, it's, it's his justification uh, before the Lord. Uh, but there are times where, when, when it talks about a righteous man, it's not our justification that's in view, but our sanctification. And so the idea isn't so much the imputation of righteousness as much as it is right living. Now, even though I think both are true, I think in this verse, I think when James says the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much, I don't think he's simply talking about somebody who's saved. I think he's talking about a more mature believer who regularly engages in right living before the Lord. And then he uses Elijah. He says Elijah was a man with a nature like with with a nature like ours, uh, and so I think he brings Elijah down to uh, uh, a a picture of normalcy. And he says uh, so. The picture is uh, Elijah as a normal person with frailties. It says and he prayed earnestly and it, that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Now, when you look at this section in 1 Kings 16 through 18, you have the idea that God is bringing judgment upon Israel for their sin. And so when Elijah prays, this is actually uh, calling down what the Lord had already decreed that he was going to do. And he's using Elijah uh, as, a, as a participant in his plan. And so it's this idea that God is bringing judgment upon Israel again because of their sin. Then in verse 18, it says, Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. And so when you see this picture here, when Elijah goes to pray, and the rain uh, is again restored to Israel, uh, if you read 1 Kings 18, verses 36 through 41, it's at a time when Israel has returned to God, and they have been restored to fellowship with him. So it's a picture of healing and restoration as the rain comes forth, and again, it's the picture that the earth produces its fruit. And then he says in verse 19, My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth, uh, and he's talking to brethren here, so he is talking to believers, and it is possible for a Christian to stray from the truth, both in doctrine and in practice. And he says, if one turns him back, that is the picture of turning him back to a walk with God and fellowship with other believers, 
when it says that let him know that he who turns a sinner, and this is a, a believer, so it's a, a it, so it's a picture of a believer who is pursuing sin, but that when let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death. Now here I think the picture is one of premature physical death. Uh, that is because he's he's pursuing a life of sin. We see passages like in Acts 5 verses 1 through 11 where we have believers like Ananias and Sapphira who are put to death because of their sin. In that context, it was lying to the Holy Spirit. We also have in 1 Corinthians 11.30 uh, an example where you have believers at the church at Corinth who were uh, engaged in uh, jealousy and strife per 1 Corinthians 3. You had a believer in 1 Corinthians 5 who was gauging in sexual immorality. Uh, and then when you get over to 1 Corinthians 11, you have believers who are engaging in selfishness. Paul even says some of them are drunk during the church service. Um, and he gets down to verse 30 where they were partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And he says, for this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. And it's almost like you have stages of discipline there that the Lord brings. The weakness, the sickness and then a number sleep and the term sleep there is uh, it's a euphemism for those who for believers who have died and in this context it would be uh, believers who have died the sin unto death and you see that also in first John 5 16 and 17 which talks about the sin unto death and this is where the believer pursues a lifestyle of sin and becomes so recalcitrant so hard-hearted against the Lord that eventually the Lord disciplines him to the point of physical death and then brings him home to heaven. Uh, so again, here in this context, he says, let him know that he who turns a sinner, that is a believer who is pursuing sin, from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So let's take up some summary points. The central idea of the text is that James encourages prayer uh, during times of suffering and for healing and for restoration of fellowship. Talking about oaths, people take oaths to lend credibility to the honesty of their words. That is, they say, I swear to God, or as God is my judge. The idea is that an oath obligates a person to keep his promise. Now, oaths were permitted in Scripture, but James seems to be telling Christians not to diminish the value of an oath by means of indiscriminate use. So Christians are to have integrity uh, so that their words, so their words sh should be taken on a simple yes or no basis. Uh, talking about oil, oil was used both in a medicinal and symbolic way. Uh, it was used as an ointment to treat physical wounds. Also, oil sometimes symbolized the work of the Holy Spirit. James seems to refer to the use of oil more in the symbolic sense, equating it with the healing effects that come from prayer. Prayer, not the oil, is what remedies the believer's ailments. And talking about Elijah, in the days of Elijah, God chose to involve his prophet in his plans and to condition the stopping and starting of rain upon Elijah's prayerful requests. James declares that Elijah was a man like us, that is, with victories and failures, but God used him to accomplish his will, and he can use us to do the same. As God's children, we should pray always, and we should pray according to God's will when we know it. Sickness is common to mankind. Some sickness is not the fault of anyone, and you can think of Job or John chapter 9 verses 1 through 3 as, as good examples. But some sickness is caused by sin. Psalm 32 verses 1 through 4 and 1 Corinthians 11:30 demonstrate that. James seems to be addressing the latter. If left unaddressed, sin can result in divine discipline that leads to physical death. When necessary, the sin-sick person is to offer confession to the elders of the church that he might be healed by the Lord after prayers are offered. Confession should be made only to those who matter, either to God alone, to the one offended, or to the elders of the church who can offer prayer for healing and restoration. Warren Wiersbe has a really good quote here. He says, We must never confess sin beyond the circle of that sin's influence. Private sin requires private confession. Public sin requires public confession. It is wrong for Christians to hang dirty wash in public, for such confessing might do more harm than the original sin.
Prayer is valid when seeking healing. However, in one instance, Paul advocated for a natural solution to an illness. And that's in 1 Timothy 5.23, in which he told Timothy to have a little wine uh, with his meal. Uh, and there are cases in Scripture where God did not heal people of their sickness. Philippians 2.25-30 and 2 Timothy 4.20 are good examples of that. We do not always know how to pray for others. Romans 8.26 states that clearly. As it may be God's will to heal a sick person, or it may be his will to use sickness as a means of divine discipline. And you can look at 1 Samuel 16, verses 14 through 16, and 1 Corinthians 5, 5 as examples of that. So it may be his will to use sickness as a means of divine discipline, or to produce humility, Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4, Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, or it could be that God will use sickness uh, as a means to bring his child home to heaven. I love the verse in 2 Kings 13, 14, which talks about the prophet Elisha, and there's just a simple clause in there that says that he became sick with the sickness with which he was to die. Elisha was not doing anything wrong. He didn't have any sin in his life. Uh, it's just that God used the sickness as a vehicle to uh, end his life and to bring him home to heaven. When God does not remove a difficult situation as we request, then he intends for us to deal with it. It's almost always the case that we prefer God change our circumstances rather than our attitude, and yet the biblical record is that God most often prefers to change us in order to develop the character of Christ in us. May we be understanding and wise in our prayers.